Hello and welcome to Cherry Red TV. I'm Ian McNay and my guest today is Wally Downs. Hi Wally. Hi Ian. And Wally of course is now manager of AFC Wimbledon, has been for several weeks. But we're basically going to talk about Wally, Wally's history, playing for Wimbledon, all the managing and coaching he's done over the years and find out more a bit deep down what Wally's like. He has co-written a book with Dave Bassett, The Crazy Gang, the, the true inside story of football's greatest miracle which is available. And another book I used for some research for this programme was Wimbledon from Premier League to, from Southern League to Premiership, a complete record by Clyde Leverdale, which is probably still available if you dig around a bit. So Wally, um, you went to school with Glenn Matlock, who was the bass player with the Sex Pistols. That's quite impressive. Well, yeah, if you like your music, it was great because the Pistols used to uh, rehearse in our six form huts uh, after school and uh, you know they'd have a good audience there and uh, it was great to hear the fledgling band come out it was it was it was new and it was vibrant and there hadn't been a, ba a, a band member at the school and uh, for a sort of a staid grammar school type place it was uh, it was really buzzy to be around there so did you watch them play yeah yeah sort of pistols play and uh, also the other two guys i knew from around and about where i lived per Stairs. Yeah, Jonesy Paul and Cookie. Yeah, yeah, Paul Steve Jonesy. Yeah. yeah, and you actually um, played football with them, you were telling yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, well. played Cookie. was a good footballer, goalkeeper and, and good on the pitch, and we used to play together locally. Jonesy, not so much. Jonesy was more of a, uh, a scoundrel than the others, really. And uh, But, uh, yeah, as I say, so I was, had, a, had, a, had a connection with three of the band. Yeah, because you quite liked music, didn't you, in your younger days? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just gigging all the time and following bands around, yeah, when yeah. I was a youngster. So what other bands did you like? Well, I used to follow the jam around. We saw the jam when I was very, very young in the Red Cow in Hammersmith. And uh, you know, I used to follow David Bowie around wherever I could. But, David uh, Bowie? Oh, yeah. I'm a huge David Bowie yeah, me fan. Too. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah. I was there 73 when he killed off uh, Ziggy Stardust. So. Yeah. yeah was, when I was 74, I was about 13, 14. And yeah. Cut me air overnight one night to spike it up <laughs> and they went mad at school and so did my mum the next day. Yeah, oh, brilliant. So... Um, you went to a grammar school, your family were market traders and you helped out on working on a fruit and veg stall. And that's something you, you did until you got a job, I think, with CBS Records. Yeah, from the age of 11 or even a bit younger, we used to go and work on the, on the, on the stall after, after school and it handy for a bit of pocket money. But all of our family did, you know, we, we all helped in there and you sort of ascended to a higher role in, in the firm and, and at, at one stage I was sort of running it myself. so. You know, it, it, it certainly brought me out and gives you a bit of confidence around people. If it's hard work, but uh, if it's a family uh, family sort of thing, then you, you're just fed into it. You, you know that you're going to roughly do it. You get about nine, ten years. You're down a stall Saturday. Don't forget, you got to be there. So before school and after school, and then it carried on to. I was still at school when I joined Wimbledon, so it carried on while I was there. And so you played for a, a team, a youth team called West London Boys. Well, that was the school, being at Clement Danes, you were part, you, well, when I was in Shepherd's Bush, you played for Hammersmith up to 11. That's the district from 10 to, 10 to 11. And then when you went to your secondary school, you became West London. So I played for West London from the age of 11, my first year at secondary school, right the way through till I left. And then you, I think you told me also previously that you were, you were wondering, would you get signed to a professional club? Because a lot of the, your mates in that team were with Chelsea, other big clubs. Yeah. And somehow you felt the break wasn't coming to yeah, you. Yeah, well, the, 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 whole th the whole way through, you know, most of my team were signed up to Fulham, Chelsea, a couple at the Arsenal. And uh, at one stage, I was the only one who hadn't been taken on. So I didn't think I was going to be a footballer. And how did the break happen in terms of how, how, who actually introduced you? Was it Darrow that found no, you? No, no, the last game... My last ever game for West London was uh, an annual thing, West London schools against Merton schools for the Tommy Trinder Trophy. Uh, it was played at Craven Cottage and at, uh, at Wimbledon. Right. And in the, uh, in the Fulham ga in the, the game at Craven Cottage, Ron Nodes and Alan Smith were there. Alan was the uh, reserve team manager at Wimbledon and Ron was, had just taken over as the owner. And it was my last ever sort of game Ron was there, I had a particularly good game. Merton had a very good side, Mickey Fillery, Chrissy Dibble, lots of people from you know the Wimbledon side, the Wimbledon side of town. 
And uh, I had a particularly good game, as I recall, and, and Ron was asking around, who's that guy? Who's he play for? And I was the only one on the whole pitch who, who wasn't affiliated to a club. So lucky that Ron was there and lucky that, that I played well on the night. And I think you were the first um, Wimbledon apprentice, is that right? Yeah, that's right. There, was, there, were, there were two of us in the first year, but I was offered first and I, uh, and I was taken on first. Me and a guy called Nigel Blazy, who I went to school with as well, but uh, uh, I was the first one. It was a part-time contract as well. And so five what, pound a week. Five pound a week. Taxed. <laughs> After tax, you got taxed. Taxed taken on. on that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so what did that involve? So we were still Southern League at that point, weren't we? Well, no, the, the, my last year, I sort of came in about three months before in the, the last of the Southern League because yes. our season was coming to an end with the schoolboy games. And so I got the, to play the last month or so in the Suburban League, which was reserves on Saturday afternoon, while the first team were having their last year of three consecutive Southern League wins that got them into the league. And that was Alan Batsford's yeah, team manager yeah. there. Yeah. So I would, although I played for the reserves on a, on a Saturday, uh, I'd get to train with the first team on Tuesdays and Thursdays because they were still part time. Right. So you were still working. Were you still working on the school, market? School. Yeah. Still at yeah, school, basically. Yeah, yeah. At school. So I'd be I'd be down the, the stall in the morning before school, help set it up. Yeah. Go after school, and then when when the, I'd, I'd sort of get off early from the stall, get on the seventy two bus down to Richardson Evans. Yeah. And how long did it take you to get your break to actually get in the first team? Well, I had a bad knee. I didn't know. It may have been the reason I didn't get taken on, but I'd fractured my knee at some point and, and it started growing apart. And uh, when I got to Wimbledon and played in the reserves, Alan Batsford looked at me and said, you know, what's, what's the problem? Why are you injured? I said, I'm not. He says, well, you're limping. And uh, it came to pass that I'd, I'd always run like that and wasn't really aware of it. Everyone else was, but I wasn't. And uh, they had me looked at and I had to have an operation on my knee. I think it was in the October. So I'd signed as an apprentice uh, in, in the summer. And in October, I had an operation, bipart patella, which was take away the back half of my kneecap. So I then spent a year rehabilitating and was sort of back ready to train the next summer. So were you worried then you might not actually make it when you... Yeah, well, the doctor at the time, the, the doctor said to me, look, you know, he said, what do you do? I said, I'm going to be a footballer. He said, I wouldn't bank on that. He said, oh, uh, you know, yeah. I, I don't think you'll play again after this. Because I remember watching you play. You, you, you had a bit of a funny run, didn't well, you? Well, that, that's, that's, that goes back from yeah. when I broke it. I couldn't fully extend, so I could never get the bulk muscle into my thigh. So I used to run lopsided. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that, that, was, that was before the operation. And even after they took it away, it enabled me to straighten my leg a lot better, but I couldn't get the full extension, which built the muscle bulk. Yeah, and were you playing with pain then, or it just... It just uh, I used to be in pain after games when I was young, and yeah. I couldn't straighten it, and, yeah. uh, but I, I didn't think anything of it until I had the operation. Yeah. But the operation was, you know, very successful, and I wasn't sore afterwards. And it's never caused me a problem until in India about six months ago when I did a little bit extra work it wasn't used to and it swelled up first time in 40 years ah, yeah so your first game was against Barnsley wasn't it yep and you scored is that right I've got it in my notes your score but maybe that's wrong I uh, the first game you said it's I've got notes I've got age 17 scored and he's yeah league scored on my debut yeah yeah against Mick McCarthy was it a good goal well, it really was. Cutting from the left and cold in the top corner. Unbelievable. Yeah, it really was a good goal. And it was against uh, Peter Springett, who I used to watch when right. I was at QPR. I was right. a great England yeah. goalkeeper. Yeah. Because that was the first of, I think, 200 appearances for Wimbledon. Yeah, yeah. And that was in our first season in the old fourth division, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hadn't, I hadn't been a substitute. I'd, as I said, I, I got back from the injury yeah. around about uh, Christmas time, got taken on as a professional then, played in the reserves and hadn't got onto the bench. But So I was just as surprised as anyone else when they called a 16-man squad and I was in the squad. But then to be told I was playing was, yeah. a, was a massive shock for me. Like, you know, it was from not being on the bench or being sub or ever being sort of fed into it, I was just thrown into the game that we had to win to get promoted. Yeah. That was the Wimbledon way, wasn't it? 
It yeah, still is, actually. Young and hungry, I hope so. Yeah. Throw them in and yeah. they either make it or they don't make sink it. Sink or swim. Johnny Gannon used to say it was sink or swim. Yeah, yeah. So you... Um, Alan Batsford was manager, I think, up until Christmas that first season. Then he then he, he left, and Dario took over. Yeah. So how was your relationship with Dario? Um, it was good. I really enjoyed working with Dario, and uh, and he it was he that got, that gave me my debut. Although I think it may have been more Dave Bassett pushing me, because the club had lo we'd lost two or three games on the trot, and we were faltering. And we didn't know where the goals were coming from, and we tried everything. So, I don't. Th I think Dario was probably a little bit more conservative about throwing me in, and I would imagine it was Bassett that uh, that edged him on because I'd not really played. I had played up front, and they knew I could do it, but I certainly hadn't been banging goals in left, right, and backwards in the reserve team. It yeah. was just a case of put him in. He's raw. He'll have a go. It might be the change that we need. That he's, he hasn't got the weight of not having got the points out the last three games. He'll go out and play with a bit of freedom, which is exactly what, what happened on the night. I'm sure if I'd have had time to think about it and, and I'd been involved more than I had been, I would have been as sort of faltery as the rest of the guys. So Dave Bassett was then the assistant manager, is yeah. that right? Yeah. yeah. And his relationship with Dario was pretty decent, I think, at the time. Very good, yeah. 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 Well, well, they were different people. You know, it, as, the, as, as their career's gone on, you can see Harry's more of a manager, although he was a great, he is a very good coach, Harry. Dario was more of a coach than a manager, although yes. Dario is, so, you know, Dave would have learned a lot from Dario and the organisation and stuff, but where, and Harry would, Harry, I would say Harry was a better manager than he was a coach. Dario was a better coach than he was a manager. Yeah. And was, was Harry, we call him Harry as you're calling him Harry. So was, was Harry a really good player, did you feel? Oh, he was a top international amateur player. Yeah, very good. Top at, international amateur, amateur player. player. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and probably could have been a pro, you know, but he, a lot of those Wimbledon players, Ian Cook, Roger, Harry, Billy Edwards, you know. Dickie Guy. Dickie, you know, Dick, Dick had a job at the, uh, at the docks for years. When Wimbledon got into the league, he wasn't going to give that job up to go, to go and get less money. Harry had his own company. Dave Donaldson, air traffic control. You know, they were 30 odd years of age, these people, and they had terrific amateur careers. They couldn't give up what they were doing to become footballers for 18 months. But the standard they were playing at, they could comfortably have played in, you know, the, the bottom two divisions. Yeah, because Ian Cook was a bank manager, I think, yeah, wasn't Yeah, well, Cookie, 33 yeah. bank yeah. managers, you know. Yeah. They're not going to give stuff up like That's that. That's right. And they, you know, they proved their worth, although it was in cup ties. If they'd have been, if their careers had taken different paths earlier, they all were good enough to have been good, solid professional footballers, no, no question. So there was this obviously change which um, Alan Batson was trying to make. Yeah. And Dario made that change more successfully, I yeah. guess, to the... Al Alan obviously had an allegiance to the people that got him in. Yeah. But to carry on the way they were carrying on, it, 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 it couldn't happen. So, you know, Dario, Dario took over that team and they had played, because Dario was an amateur footballer at Sutton, so they would played against Dario and with and and they were a lot more successful than Dario. So I would imagine there would have been some friction there for someone who they would have been seen who is a lesser player coming in and being manager. I don't know, but I would certainly think that that would be a dynamic. <clears throat> and Dario being a young coach at the time would have wanted younger players to work with. Yes. You know, so there was a transition that had to happen. And whether Alan could have made that transition, I think yes, because he was clearly a great manager. But you know the, the the time frame that Ron wanted it done in was difficult for Alan to to clear out the people that had got him there. Put it that way. Yeah. So and then we had this extraordinary yo-yo years of four, three, four, three, four, three. I think. Have you have you got it? Because I think I've got it. It's fourth, third, fourth. Is that right? Oh, <laughs> well, I, I couldn't tell, but I, I, I can reel it off. I think. Yeah. Four, that, four, that's th three, four, three, four. Three, two, two, one. Correct. And it took actually, because the fans sing about nine years how it took us to get when we reformed into the Football League. It took nine years to get from the Football League this time round to the old First Division, which was the top league. Yeah. So, uh, but, you know, everyone, years. but this, it, it wasn't, see, it wasn't the, 
the breeze, not the breeze that everyone thinks. There was a couple of relegations in there that were really hard to take at, at the time for a, for a young team, you know. So it wasn't like 4 3 2 1 bang. No, no, we went down twice. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And so I think after the first time we went down, then Bassett took over mid season from Dario Grady as manager. And that was a bit of a change of style. I think that's when yeah. we went a bit more direct. Mm. Not as direct as later on, but I mean, uh, it really was just a case of, of a bit of feel good factor because all of those players had played for most, well, had come through under Harry in the reserves. Like Harry, you know, he put, I was out of the team at the time. Harry put me straight back in. Right. right? And, and, the, and the youngsters that he'd had, he knew that he could put them in. He had real faith in us. So it was a case of, get, and we went on the great run to get promoted Harry's first year. So, you know, that Harry coming in and having faith in the kids that he'd had gave the team a lot of impetus because it was struggling a little bit under Dario. So what qualities did Harry bring in that maybe weren't there before or gone, or gone latent before? Um, I don't know if they were qualities. It, it, it was just a togetherness and a trust in that young group that he had. Harry was very vibrant. Uh, and he was very, he was a little bit more pragmatic than Dario. Dario, you know, Dario's sides played and, and he had a system that he liked and, and, and he wouldn't be as focused on individually winning a game as Harry. Harry was had a massive winning mentality. Mm. And, and we were aware of that as kids in the reserves, not a win at all costs thing, but certainly how to win games. Whereas when you played for Dario, it, it wasn't so focused on the winning. That's why I think Dario was a better coach than he was a manager. Mm. He would, you know, very good manager and, and brought a lot of players through. But Harry was the same, but very focused on l making us know how to win football matches. He made you believe in yourself yeah, as well. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he, he, you know, he trusted it. Because he'd coached us for three or four years, the Mark Morrises, the Glynn, the Paul Fishing and people like that, and and he brought those players through, and he and he gave them the, the trust that they needed. So, um, when did the actual crazy gang? Because you, because you, you know, this this book kind of crazy gang. When did the crazy gang actually start? Because you are given the credit of starting. Yeah, Is that well, true? It, you, you know what it was? It? it was it was me and Steve. Well, it came out with. Um, with Tony Stenson when we were playing Nottingham Forest and they come and asked. Oh, this, this is far later then. Yeah, yeah, much later. Okay, but, yeah. but Steve Parsons and I, we, we used to travel in together from Shepherds Bush. He was from Notting Hill. And there was a, a gang of fellas who we knew who were, uh, that was their moniker. That was their name. You know, they were they were criminals, to be fair. You know, they were, they were, <laughs> they, they were arm robbers and bank robbers and thieves. <laughs> And, and their little and their nickname ran the crazy ran not, and it was a crazy game, which was after the old musical act. Yes. Know? So, you know, we used to say that in in jest, and, and and then we started calling it ourselves, just me and Steve. And then when Steve left, that's when we got a sort of bit of publicity, and then we we are the crazy gang. That was, yeah. And then it got some some oxygen. Well, we come on to that later. I didn't realise that was so much later. But one of the things that always surprised me was that in those early days and maybe even later you were having a full english breakfast before training well like i said i'd, I'd have to get up at five i'd get up at five o'clock in the morning yeah. go to covent garden market so by the time i got back to the training ground but by the time i'd gone back to the, the stall and set it all up and worked how it was going to be for the day i'd been up four or five hours so and I, you did that when you were you were a full-time professional yeah 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 that's I, extraordinary yeah yeah i did that till i did that until i moved to Kingston to be near the training ground when I was when my boy was born, so eighty five six. So you must have had loads of stamina to do that. Get up so earlier in the morning. You're working for a few hours. You got your breakfast, okay? Which you had to pay for, didn't you? Yep, yep. To egg, when I had my own two eggs, bacon, and tomatoes, that was my yeah. breakfast. And then you're training. Yeah. And you get a rest in the afternoon, or you get. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd go home and have a couple of hours kip and rest up in the afternoon, but then I'd go down the stall and pack it away and, or, or you know, be there to take the money and, yeah. and make sure everything was okay. So I'd be done at about four o'clock in the afternoon, leave the last couple of hours. My, my younger brother was on the stall at that stage. So. so there was no kind of, there was no research about diet in those days? No, wasn't zero, there? zero, no. So but it was a level playing field, you know. Yeah, all the clubs were the same. Yeah. yeah. So... 
I it was let me. It was frowned upon me having the breakfast by everybody else in, in the, at the so time. It wasn't the whole. It wasn't the whole team. Down. No, 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 no. no. The, the, you know, they come in and have a bit of cornflakes, or they have a bit of, might have scrambled yeah. eggs. So it's important to eat, but you know, I, I needed that bit extra. And so, what comes across in the book is that that Harry Bassett, he really, he really kind of built you up to be the one that kind of managed the dressing room, ribbed the players a bit, a bit of a laugh but not too out of control, to try and help build this spirit that was became the Wimbledon spirit. Mm. Is that how you remember it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he had to come down on me a couple of times when you know I got a bit too boisterous or you know we went a little bit too far. But he was very good at that. You know, he he knew that we that the group that we were were an ebullient group, and you know, and we built in confidence and we fed off of each other. And he was loath to sort of to knock that out of us. Which he, you know, Harry's that way anyway. He, he likes people around him who are uh, fiery, who've got opinions, who are energetic, uh, uh, and who want to to achieve things. You know, he's, he's not a great one for shrinking violets in any of his teams. Of course, you get occasional players that are quiet, and and you have to respect that. And but in general, you know, you come into this group, it's an up and atom group. And did he sometimes bring players in you felt didn't fit, or did he was he pretty good at choosing the right characters? Yeah, uh, no, because you know when you, the research wasn't really there then as much as it is now. And uh, as I said, John Gannon said sink or swim, and good players come. There were good players that came to us who didn't last because they weren't as good as the group that we had. Supposedly better players, you know, coming from clubs higher above us. And they'd come and think, oh, we've got someone coming in from Ipswich or we've got someone coming in from Wolves. They're going to be good. And all of a sudden they come in and, you know, it made us realise that we were better than we thought we were. Yeah. So, you know, occasionally, occasionally, we, I mean, once we got a bit looking back, it wasn't a great thing to do. Dave Besson was having a, a contractual argument with Harry, probably over about 30 quid or something. <laughs> and, Harry got, and Harry got a new goalkeeper in to come in and, and we... We didn't welcome him with open arms, put it that way. It wasn't, looking back, it was awful. But we were a very s solid group together and we felt that Lurch was being treated unjustly. And uh, it, it wasn't, looking back, it wasn't our, my proudest moment, the fact that we didn't, you know, treat this guy better than we did. It was our sort of protest to Harry that he, he was saying to us he wanted to get Lurch out and get another goal in and we were sort of stuck together and said, well, no, we, we, it, it wasn't right what we did professionally. But looking back, it shows how tight well, how tight the group was, and it kind of worked for the team, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, and and I suppose if you ask Harry now, he'd say the same thing. You know, that that's how tight we were as a group. Yeah. If we felt there was a bit of an injustice, you know, we'd we'd certainly stick together. Yeah, we'll come on to it later. But of course, I guess you'd like to build the same thing in AFC Wimbledon. Have this have this kind of you're a family and you fight for each other and you really stick together. But of course, it's it's different times now. And one of the things when we were, we were chatting on the coming on the train back from Fleetwood, um, we were talking about the number of players who actually came through the Wimbledon system and played in all four divisions for Wimbledon. So the old fourth, old third, old second, old first, which would never happen these yeah. days. A player playing in all four divisions for one club, and there was quite a few of them, wasn't there? Yeah, I think out of a squad of 22, there were nine of us that played in all four divisions, and in the squad of 22. I think, but Harry's normally more on top of this than me, that there was 14 that had come through the youth that had played, that played in the Premiership. They hadn't played all four, there was a group who played all four divisions and out of the 22, I think it was about 12 or 13, had come through the youth team. Which is so extraordinary because the, the different styles of play, the different presumably levels of fitness and ability you would need, but you, you, you all developed together, it sounds like. Yeah, well, it, it was because we had, was a, there's a continuity between Bassett and Jeff Taylor, who was the youth team coach at the time. Okay. And he knew exactly what sort of player Harry wanted and they were integrated in and, you know, there was an Andy Thorne who was said to be like a similar one to me, not the quickest but read the game and understood things. And there was Brian Gale, who was the big strong one with Thorny. And, you know, there was kids coming under it, Johnny Gannon coming through like Glyn Hodges, good left foot. But they all, they were all given uh, a terrific grounding by Jeff. Uh, and Jeff came in a little bit after Harry, although he'd been with Harry everywhere, non-league. So the players that came through, 
were very, very consistent with, with the group that had come through before them, like the Gannons and Priddles and Andy Sayers and Brian Gowes and Simon Traces and people like that. You know, they followed the traits of the, of the team that was before them. And we were very inclusive with the young kids as well. You know, we'd, we'd take time with them and, and work with them. And I, I also picked up somewhere, I don't know if it was the book or somewhere else, that you and Glyn Hodges actually had quite, that's the wrong word, violent, but had quite extreme records on the pitch. And I think you had the one point, you had the worst record for... Well, the club Football did four league. years on the trot. We had we broke the we kept having to go up break, breaking the disciplinary uh, records, and then but then for four years on the trot we also had the individual. Uh, I think Stevie Galliers was the first year. Can't remember the second year. I wound up the third year, and then Glynn wound up topping my uh, amount on the fifth year on the fourth year. So and bearing in mind we were both wingers, that wasn't really. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> weren't really acceptable. We were supposed to be getting kicked, not doing the kicking. But did you regard yourselves as dirty, stroke hard players, or was it just partly the image that when we accumulated? No, no. We, you know, we were we played a very fast, fluid game, and we challenged everywhere. So there were going to be bookings, and the fact that that Glenn and I were, were you know, we we weren't dainty little wingers, you know. If we were going to get kicked, we'd be doing some kicking back, you know. That, that, and I think that was a that was part of our success. The fact that we, you know, we were we were talented on the ball and could deliver the ball in, but also had a streak where we couldn't be bullied out of a game. You know, he's a very very good player and went on to play for Chelsea. But Phil Driver was a winger for us, yeah, remember, yeah. and you know, if I'd have been playing against Phil, I'd have sort of tried to intimidate him and and, and foul him and and get into his head. Now, if someone did that to me or Hodge, they was going to come out on the wrong end of that. Yeah, and so players were scared of you. Is that right? Well, I, I, yeah, I, I hope so. Yeah, <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't bothered if they were. No, that was a, yeah. that was great for me because you know both of us weren't blessed with a lot of pace. Glenn had a lot more talent than me, but I could manipulate the ball and cross it. But physically, you know, physically for pace we couldn't get past them. Yeah. So we had to sort of out outthink them. And clearly, defenders used to had, had a license to come through players then. And they would get the upper hand over little wingers, all that, uh, you know, give him one early and the ref won't book you and he'll drift out of the game. Applied, but not to me and Glenn. If you started kicking us, then you you, you would uh, come out on the wrong end of it. These, these days, there's so much analysis. And, and I know um, when I used to talk to Neil Ivey, he analysed who we're going to play so thoroughly. And he had videos of their last few games, analysed all their strengths and weaknesses. And it seems from what I can pick up, partly from you and partly from other people, that actually Wimbledon were doing that far earlier than most clubs, analysing who we're going to play. And Harry used to give you quite precise instructions, didn't he, about how to handle certain players. So it seems that Wimbledon were ahead of their time in terms of having all this analysis, videos where, where, where they're available to show you what the opposition did. Well, you know, Harry, Harry's very open-minded, you know, anything that was available he, he would look to use because we didn't have the resources to go and buy the best players in the division, you know, we, we had to make the, the most out of what we had and the reserve goalkeeping guy, Paul Jones, his dad was the, he was at Wimbledon Nick and he was the, the traffic control cop and we used to use one of their speed camera video things and he would video our games for us. Okay. And Harry had a guy called Vince Craven who'd worked with Don Howe for a long time. Uh, and he he had a bank of Beta Max or whatever they were at the time. And he would individually cut the opposition up and cut us up. And Harry would show us, uh, you know, we'd, we'd watch for an hour a week our own per personal analysis and the team's analysis. And of course, it, that ruined the days of I didn't do that because I <laughs> he fucking did do that, you know. But as I say, Harry was, you know, right. We didn't have the resources to have it done properly, but not many teams were doing it. Yeah. And for him to do it was, uh, it certainly made us much better players. Because now, when I coach players, their attention span and their learning styles are so different to what we, how we were. We'd be out there for two hours, repetition, repetition, repetition. Great way to learn. But now kids are brought up looking on their iPads and their screens, yeah. and their attention span is is much less. Yeah. So you can learn equally as much. I find. You can learn equally as much 15 minutes in the classroom pointing stuff out than you can by taking them out 
and and having them sort of work and and they they find it dull. It's purely because of the way they learn nowadays. Did you feel that when you when, when you were in the old third and third and the old second division that you could get in the top league and stay in the top league? No, not for a moment. But every time we had success, we got up and thought, oh, this ain't this ain't all it was cracked up to be. Oh, yeah. Second division, oh, this ain't all it's thought we was going to get relegated. So, you know, we're better players now. So every time the trainers came in, we, you know, we adjusted to it very quickly after those first couple of relegations. And, and the fact that we've run away with the fourth division the first time gave us momentum to get through. And uh, and the best way, when we finally got into the Premier League, it was, we were such a good unit then that they didn't want to play us. Well, we finished sixth the first season. Yeah. Extraordinary. Yeah. And, and I, I will say this because, uh, not because I didn't play in it, but I think we were a better team. And it's difficult to say because Bob had it, but that team that we had that got beat in the quarterfinals, we should have done better. We went to Portugal and, you know, we, had, we, we could have done better. I think we could have won it that year. This is the year before we the did year win before, the FA yeah. Cup. Yeah. Well, there's a thought. When it two years running, that would have been something, wouldn't it? Well, Harry might not have left if we'd have won it. You yeah. know, you don't know how it is. But yeah. I mean, we had we had a team. I'm not clearly not knocking the team after. It's a completely different team. But we we could have done better in that quarter final. The way we prepared, and you know, perhaps we shouldn't have gone away. Perhaps we should have stuck with what we were doing, and and focused on that a little yeah. bit more and won that. So when when we signed Vinnie Jones, you roomed with him, and you got quite close with Vinnie, and still are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, everybody had known about Vinny for about a year because we used to have close links with um, Wildstone via Alan Batsford because uh, he was the manager and, um, what was it, Brian? No, I can't remember. But uh, we, and we would go down and play them regularly and Vinny was one that we were always looking at. Derek French had grown up in the, grown up in the same village as him, so he knew him. And when he finally came in after having a year in Sweden, Harry pulled me and said, "Look, oh, Frenchy pulled me first. Said, look, look after him when he comes in. Like, you know, he's a bit of a live wire, but you know, don't make make sure everyone's not on him." He said, "He's all right. He's a good kid." So I said, "Yeah, well, I'll make sure." So I looked at low venue, right? Nice to meet you. Well, got together and done around the warm up with him and everything, and made him welcome because, you know, as we, as we said previously, it was a t tight knit club, and then your first day can you know be critical really for how you are at the club. So he joined in and soon became one of us and was, was part of it, but wasn't in the first thing. And then Harry said to me, look, I'm going to throw him in. He said, so he's going to room with you, look after him. Yeah. Which is like walking around with a bomb in your pocket for the next <laughs> 18 months and then looking after Vinny. <laughs> I just remember there was that way game at Forest. We lost 3-2, he made his debut. Then he scored the only goal at home we, when we beat Man U. And United the next game. And the next game, I think we won 4-0 away at Chelsea. He scored again. He's yep. an extraordinary little run. Yeah, brilliant. Well, yeah, start. Well, he started knotting him. when he, He's caught the ball, give the penalty away at Knotts Forest. And he came in at half-time and said to Sid Neil, how well do you think I'm doing? He says, I don't think you'll be going out in the second <laughs> half. Get your shirt. And that was a 78-year-old kit man telling him that. <laughs> <laughs> so a very inauspicious start. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, of course, you got started to get injured more, didn't you? Yeah. And I think you. Well, are, I'd already had two by then. You'd had two by yeah. then, yeah. Which was, um, I think, you had, altogether you had quite four quite serious injuries. Yeah, broke both ankles twice each. So, you know, as you said, I played two hundred odd games up to the age of twenty four, and by the time I finished, when I was twenty eight, I played two another, I think, sixteen games from the age of twenty four. So, yeah. two hundred up to twenty four, sixteen games. Up to 28. Yeah, so. That's really frustrating as a player, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, possibly I, I could have carried on somewhere, somehow, but, you know, you just, after the last, another f another year of recuperating, five years, play, play for, th you know, six games, year out, six games, year out, three games, year out. You know, it's, it's, it was destroying for me. But you played. I'm just looking at the, the what I what I took out of um, Clive's book here. You did play 15 games in our first season, the top flight, which yeah. isn't too bad. Yeah. So when you, I broke it against Coventry, was it? Can't remember. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, Coventry, I'm sure you well, do. Vinny and I midfield. So. Yeah. I, I, you know, that was when I was playing my best stuff. You know, I'd yeah. come back and playing in the Premier League was, was the, the first, first division, division yeah. as it was. Yeah. yeah. You know, I I felt that I was playing the best. You know, after. 
the, the, the knowledge that I'd sort of got from watching had really helped me. Yeah. And I was at an age, you know, where I would have been at my peak. So yeah, I, I felt I was really playing well then. Yeah, and I think one of the things that I read was that what you did when you were injured, you sat in a dugout with Harry Bassett yeah, and you well, were watching. Harry, yeah, Harry used to sit right up the back first half and yeah. you know, I'd sit with him and it was very, you know, yeah. opens your eyes as a young kid and and uh, to hear his thoughts and, and what it was like was uh, was good for me. And perhaps it you know may have helped him to have a, a player who can still sort of relate to what what the feel would be on the pitch. Yeah. You know, knowing he'd be saying, oh, what's he doing? And I'd say, yeah, but that ain't happening. So it's not that he wouldn't know that, but there's still a feel of, and he'd say, well, why is that? And it, and, and it really helped me. I don't know it helped you, and you could give him the player's input as well. Yeah, possibly, yeah. 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 And the, you, but it's a case of Harry sort of thinking that, uh, thinking that I was useful to him, and it would have been useful to me, to, you know, to to show that belief in me, to have me around him like that. And so you, it's a little summary towards the end of the book of of why this amazing thing happened that we got up, or for, we got promoted, 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 and got to the first division. And one of the things you said was we learn from the adversity of relegation. Yeah. Lessons were learned there. Yeah. And also prepared meticulously, which you kind of recovered. Yeah. You, you kind of covered. Degree of irreverence to any other team. Didn't yeah. fear anybody, did you? No. Well, as we were going, certainly the best example is when you go into, into when we played Nottingham Forest, we, we had a little relationship with Forest. We played them two years on the trot and four games drawn out the hat against them. Now, if Nottingham Forest were drawn against West Bromwich Albion, you know, they'd go out and it'd be like a chess match and who would do we, we couldn't afford that. We had to go out with no respect for them. We had to go out and say, look, we're, you know, we are the underdogs. We're going to play like underdogs and we can't respect them because if we did, that would mean we'd be stand off them. And if we stood off them in boxing terms, they would have just picked us, picked us off, bang, bang, bang. So yeah. we had to get in and disrupt what they were doing and and swarm them and and hope that it, it would it would overcome them and you know invariably it did yeah and i think if we'd have got caught up in a football match against nottingham forest you know they'd have wiped the floor of us we had to try and impose the way we played on them take them out of their comfort zone which was playing a nice passing game and we had to put them under pressure now could they cope with playing under pressure over the course of two legs no they couldn't and Brian Clough had respect for that, didn't well, he? Yeah, of course he, was, he, he would understand that. You know. And that, when you play good football in teams like that, you know, we, we did have that. Um, we had the, uh, the, you talk about the disciplinary thing, but well, that was in the lower leagues, you know, when it was every man for himself. Now, when we got up against Nottingham Forest, there was no fights, no people sent off. You know, they were, they were two rip-roaring football matches for anyone who remembers them. Yeah. You know, two different styles. He respected the style of football we played. And uh, you know we, we we aspired to plan as well as Nottingham Forest. And again, you touched on this. You said in the book you train very professionally, repetition on training ground, doing things over and over again. So you kind of knew not only what you were doing, but what everybody else was doing. Well, we knew how we played. We had a, we had a, a DNA and an identity in how we played. You know, we were all on the same page. And if anybody sort of veered off of it, that we were self-regulatory. You know, I often look back and think that we we couldn't have, but that we were we could have managed ourselves. After David, you know, instilled in us how he wanted us to play, we Glenn and I didn't really agree with it because we, you know, we we wanted to play more football, but we were part of a group. We knew what made us successful, and we got on with the job. And uh, you know, the, everybody knew everybody's strengths, and and if we didn't play to them, to the benefit of the team, they were soon called out. Yeah, and you wrote a line which I liked, which was, we were like young lions skirmishing every day. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you were like young lions, even though you weren't always young at the time. Yeah. You were kind of, it was a skirmish, well, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, because, this is, you know, every game I ever played for Wimbledon, we were underdogs. Every game, because, in the foot, you know, the smallest wage bill, so we'd be pl paid less than whoever we were playing against. Yeah. Smallest crowds, yep. smallest budget, smallest stadium. So in the fourth division, we was all that. Managed to get out of it, went up into the third division. Again, got relegated back in and still the same applied. Then our wages hadn't got bumped up massively to come down. So every game I ever played, those 200 odd games, we were underdogs. We shouldn't have won. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, and the other thing I want to mention was, which I really liked at the time, and it's not so prevalent now, is like you would often come back on the away games with the fans on the train, and you're all mixed up. Yeah. It kind of now it's okay. It's it's not. When we were in the combined counters, it's more like that. Now it's less like that. It's not. It's not impossible for the for the fans to mix with the players. But in those days, it was part of it, wasn't it? You kind of were on the train. The fans were on the train, had a few drinks, and that that was normal. Yeah. Well, to be fair, it's it's less. You, you encourage them less to have a few beers on a coach now. Just be just just because you know. A lot of the teams don't, and, and, and the research is that your body doesn't need alcohol after the shock of playing a football match. Yeah. You know, it's much better to get it out of the way, and if it's come 10 o'clock at night or 9 o'clock, you want to have a glass of wine or a couple of beers. But the immediate aftershock that your body goes okay. through the 90 minutes, alcohol is the last thing you need okay. quickly. Of course, have a couple of pints later on, but you know, let it go. But, but I think what it may be, that there's a... It may be the fans now that the, the the expectation, everything's so binary. You know, if you lose, the manager's got to go. The players aren't no good. And yeah. whereas before, everyone, you know, you lose you lose a few games, and it's it's not so. He's got to go. He's got to go. You could chat and talk and have a beer and all oh, right, a couple of beers. Forget about it. Let's go Tuesday. Whereas now, the expectation with fans is. You know the manager might have to go if it, three games. You know they're onto him, or yeah. this player's no good. That player. So I think what it is, it's it, there is there is a sort of divide now between fans and players that that if it gets close like that, the the, the ones that are very opinionated about it now are more opinionated than they would have been, however long ago it was. So yeah. I think no, there's more more case for friction. I think. Yeah. So you left Wimbledon. Even though you had had the injuries, you, and 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 Bassett did take you to Sheffield United, yep. where you I think you played a few games, didn't you? Yeah, broke it again up there against so, Sheffield Wednesday, and that was pretty much it. For yeah, the playing pretty career. much. Yeah. And then it was Ron Nodes who encouraged you to really go into coaching. Well, he, it, Ron had been saying to me from the age of about twenty-two, "Why don't you pack up and be a coach?" So that was. <laughs> It wasn't very inspiring for my football career, but you know he'd seen something in me where he thought I, I had a personality and and the knowledge to because I'd passed my coaching badges when I was quite young and took an interest. You know he was forward thinking, Ron, and he always thought because I suppose because he discovered me as a player, he had an extra interest in me and wouldn't want to see me not stay involved. And he and he yeah. thought probably rightly that I could have had a better career as a coach than I would have done as a player and then you but you don't listen to that when you're a young player yeah because you want to play I completely understand that yeah so you join Millwall to help with the academy yeah and suddenly oh my first day yeah um, Millwall were the only public company in the country then and they were in the in the top division that's right they were PLC I they were the first about. and only yeah, PLC that's yeah. So then they were, f they were down the bottom as the transfer win deadline was coming up, as it was then, not a window, it was a deadline. And uh, the, the manager, who was uh, John Doherty, and his assistant, Frank McClintock, were told by the parent company, the PLC, that they had to sell Cascarino and or Sheringham. Uh, there'd been bids in from Aston Villa and somewhere else. And they, pr they said, no, we're not doing it. We're not, you know, if we do, we'll be, we'll be relegated. So the PLC said, well, what do you want to do about it? They said, well, we've, we've resigned. So, so they said, OK, resign. I was there to do a bit of academy work, my first in, and the assistant, the first team coach, Frank Sibley, was made man interim manager. And he said to me, come on, you can do the, we'll do the first, I'll make you first team coach. And I had to go from sitting there to, to meet the academy director to possibly get some work on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I had to find some boots and go and take the Millwall First Division team. As I said, Cascarinos, Les Briley, who was I played with at Wimbledon, all my contemporaries and peers. I had to then, f from nowhere, go and become their first team coach. Totally out of the blue. So, so what did you do on the first day? I just did something that was very, very... I remembered Bassett used to do with us that we hated, that was really, really hard work. and. Uh, you know, the, the, to be fair, the, they boy, the boys did it all right, but they was like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> they put on what they were used to doing, 
this was a very, very tough session. And to be fair, it was a baptism of fire that it, it worked. It was difficult for them, but we got away with it. Show them who was boss. Well, it's Turn difficult off. to show Terry Erlock who's boss, but <laughs> at least I got him running about a bit. Yeah. yeah. And then, then you move. I'm not going to spend too long in your coaching career, but you then moved to Palace, where yep. you stayed quite a few years with Steve Koppel. Yeah, I had four good years at Palace, and uh, we, we finished. I went there the year after they, they played Man United in the Cup, and did our, my first year. Uh, we finished third in the Premier League, so it might have been Premier League. I think it was first year of the Premier League. We had Wright and Bright up front, and Wimbledon fans remember Andy Thorne and Brian Gow were you know the two centre halves and it was a shame because it was a very good team that didn't qualify because of the uh, you know the European disaster so That's the thing, yeah. it was a very good team yeah, yeah so um, Koppel stayed at Palace for how long did he stay well, there? Well Steve sort of went in and out Steve left I left Alan Smith took over uh, I went to Sheffield United right. and Steve sort of, he, he, I can't remember where Steve went, he went somewhere but then he came back as director of football and he had a longer association, you know, he's he's always stayed there. Is it true that Steve Koppel didn't like defensive coaching so he put you in charge? Well there wasn't a role for me, Ron said to Steve, look I like Wally, I want him on board for future reference, find him, a, find him something. Steve said well there isn't a role here, Ron said well, you know, put him with the reserves, put him with whatever you want to do. So Steve met with me in, in Chiswick, he said, you know, he's a very upfront guy, Steve. He said, look, Ron's told me to get you. He said, I didn't need anyone, but Ron's told me to get you on board. What do you want to do? I said, Steve, I'm, I'm open to do whatever you want me to do. He said, well, look, I don't particularly like taking defenders. And, and he, again, he's very forward thinking and he, he watches a lot of NFL and, uh, and they have different coaches for different okay. areas. And yeah. Steve said, look, why don't you work with the defense? Yeah. Two, two of the days a week take them away do what you want to do yeah. which I did and uh, it was very successful yeah well to finish third in the top division is pretty good yeah for and, and it was yeah. and it was a very I mean right and bright up front banging goals in helps yeah. but you know yeah. it was, we certainly we made that a thing we, we, got, we got very close as a group and I take them away and we do our own stuff against the youth team so they were successful and you're sort of really reaffirming some positives with them and and it beca we got a sort of a you them and us um, amongst the team where the back forwards you know they would deride the forwards if they hadn't scored and so, so there was competition amongst yeah. the team in training which was I found very healthy yeah yeah and then you went to Sheffield United and to Bury you didn't stay there either very long either club, but I had three you? three years at Sheffield United I did it, have three it, years as the there, opening okay. it was the start of the under twenty one. Uh, league yes, they had at the time okay. which is probably now the under 23 but that was the first year the Premier League had that so I had two years with that and a year as Dave's assistant yes and then my, Dave left and I, I left with him but my house in London was rented out for the year so I was sort of stuck up in Sheffield and I got a call from Stan Turner and Sam Ellis at Berry. would I like to come over there and had a wonderful year there and we won the league won the fourth division or the yeah. third division as it, the third division as it is now yeah yeah, that was the first time Barry had ever won that, and 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 a great year there. But then, you know, my time had finished. I could come back to London. And when you came back to London, you went to Brentford. Yeah, I had a year where I was scouting for for Bassett. Yeah. Bassett had gone to Nottingham Forest there, and there was no role. But again, Ron came for me when he was manager at Brentford and and asked me to come in as he was standing aside. And you were assistant manager at Brentford, is that right? Well, Ray Lewington and Terry Bullivant were Ron's assistants, but Ron. You know, Ron stepped down from the role because he wasn't happy with the way it was going. Put Ray and Terry as joint managers. I came in as first team coach. First team coach. Yeah. Then Ray and the, and Terry left in the summer. I thought I might have got the job, but Ron was going to fund it to the same extent for another year, which I think was four million quid. So he bought Steve in to have he one. He was putting four million four pound million of his own in. money in. Yeah. Wow. Well, the club where and Ron was, but that was the wage. That was the wage bill for Brentford yeah. then. Yeah. So we had another crack at getting into the into the championship when we got to yeah. Wembley and got beat by Stoke. Uh, so that was that year gone. And then Ron said, you know, he did say one year and he cut it so that it, it could run itself, which went from four million a year to I think it was half a million a year, which was 10,000 pound a week, 20 players, 500 pound a week. Yeah. So Steve, that's really a recipe for 
not success. So Steve yeah. walked away from that, and that's the opportunity I got at Brentford. And then you were actually a manager, weren't you? Two years out of yeah. that, yeah. Or yeah. year and you know, three quarters. Yeah, and that, as you say, was tough because the budget was yeah, so Yeah, it low. proved too much. You know, I, I'd, I'd found a goalkeeper for £7,000 <clears> and had to sold him to keep the club afloat during the close season, which they said, it's not an issue, get rid of him, don't worry as long as the club's solvent. Yeah. I said, well, my job's okay, is it? If I said, no problem, Wally. But then we dropped into the bottom three and and, and they acted, although there was nobody to act, they just, they'd just become a fans club and it wasn't anywhere near as well developed as, as we are at AFC. Yeah. There were three or four guys and the two people they had in charge weren't of the quality that was required, in my opinion. But, and you found it was a pretty lonely job being a manager there, didn't you? Well, it was. You know, you'd finish you, after a game. You go up into the boardroom. There was nobody there. You had no. There was no real support. Ron had stepped away from it, although he was still the owner. So, I didn't have a lot of contact with Ron. And he always said to me, it was one of his regrets that he couldn't man. He couldn't be in charge while I was manager to give me the support that yeah. he would have liked to have done. But you must have learnt from that. Yeah. Well, looking back. If I'd have stayed, at the, the thing I should have done was left after a year. We had, a, I was, you know, we were top of the league after ten games, and uh, and, it, and we and we finished okay, mid table. But if you're not allowed to add to the squad and you're only going to get it taken away for your own career as a manager, a, a, um, a more experienced manager would have looked at that and thought, as Steve had done, I'm not going to be able to. This is not going to get any better. I should leave now. And so while people. Had, my stock's sort of relatively high at that level and look around for something better because it's only going to get worse there. Yeah. For someone else coming in, it's a wonderful opportunity. But, you know, for you having done what you can for the year, looking at it, thinking, well, I'm not going to be able to get any players. It's getting away from me a little bit. If someone else comes in, he's got that fresh impetus. I should have left after a year. And then you went to Reading, I think. Yeah, well, Steve had left and gone. He'd yeah. gone to Brighton that a year, and then went to Reading and, and called me over. So you had a very decent relationship with Steve. Yeah, very good working relationship. Yeah, 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 very good. And Reading actually got promoted, didn't they, during that time from the Championship to the Premiership? Yeah, yeah. Well, we still we hold the record, the best team to come out of the Championship, 106 points. Yeah, that was a that was a perfect storm. You know, I was about I think I was about 45 then. I'd accumulated all, you know a lot of coaching knowledge and experience. Steve was a very experienced manager, and everything that came together. Then we got good players, and it, it couldn't. We, I think we only we we lost two games all year, which is extraordinary yeah. these days. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you were first team coach then. Yeah, yeah. Well, a sister, but there was two of us. We inherited a guy as well, so you know he he was Steve didn't lose him, and we were first team coaches. Yeah. So uh, you know you move clubs a lot, but each time I would guess you learnt more. You've in terms to. of what was involved in the yeah. job and how to handle situations that were difficult. Because yeah. it's one thing being a player and learning, isn't it? Completely different being a... Well, you look, you, when you're playing, you learn, and it's sort of tacit knowledge after a while. It's just, it's just in you and your muscle memory, and you know and you adapt to what it is. Uh, but you do, not many players would go home and think about it and analyse it and what, what did I do there and how do I get... It? They do now. Yeah. But then you just played, forgot it and got on with it. Whereas nowadays with the analysts, uh, analysts, analytics that are there and, and everything and the information. Players know the game more and are better equipped to, to learn now, whereas in our day, played, finished. Yeah. Was there, was there any of those clubs you were at that you felt a degree of the Wimbledon type spirit? Well, any club that you're successful at, there is a spirit. You know, everyone says, uh, they've got a great spirit. You'll find that with successful teams. If, you've got, if you're going well, you got a good dressing room, great spirit, yeah. and one they interact with each other. If you're not going very well, it's very difficult to have a good team spirit because they're all you know you're, you're looking to find solutions to stuff and it's not happening. And everybody knows they're trying. And, it, and we, how do we get out of this? We work hard, or so you work harder. You still lose, and when you lose, that's when the dressing room is on the floor and it's difficult to pick up. Amazing how much a couple of wins make the difference. You know, you can have a dressing where you've got some bad eggs that you may have inherited and that's your job as a staff to get rid of quickly. But if you're not willing games and you're not doing well, 
the place goes and it, and it feeds around to the spans and it it's like it's it gets it's like around. a disease isn't it it, it is. starts spreading it is and then the only thing that stops it is the winning football matches yeah okay and then uh you were at southampton after reading where where you, again you were i think first team coach yeah yeah we uh i went to pa alan pardew they'd had a financial discrepancy somehow and they had a 10 point deduction start of the season they were in league one weren't league they, one yeah and alan had only won one game out of the first seven and they had new owners and they were you know he was in a bit of trouble so he spoke with steve Coppel about going down to to assist him well, and steve said no i don't want to do that he said well why don't you call wally i went down and we got on and we had a terrific run just finished outside the playoffs and won the johnson paint trophy which for you know it was a wonderful day at wembley we played i'm saying plymouth Sorry, it may be wrong, but we had fifty thousand Southampton fans there. Yeah. You know, it was a, a, a terrific. Yeah, it was. It might have been Carlisle, but uh, you know, a big club and uh, and a great victory and and, and close to the, the playoffs from a really poor start. But then the next season, Alan didn't really get on great with the Italian owner, and uh, we drew the first game on TV, won the second game four 0 away, and got sacked on the Monday. <laughs> That's football, isn't That's it? That's football. Yeah. And then you were briefly at Gillingham and then you joined West Ham. Well, I just went yeah. to I went to help out because Gillingham had, Gillingham yeah. had gotten beaten in the cup by Dover. And uh, Paul Scully, the owner, really liked Andy Hessenthaler. He said, but the trouble is we've had some dodgy couple of league results and we've just got beat by Dover in the cup. I should really get rid of him. He said, but I really like him. And I know he's going through a bad passion, but if it, if it, I, it can't stay as it is, I want him to get through this. Would you come in and help? So I said, yeah, of course I'll come in. I said, but you've got to let him know that I'm not coming in to get his job. So I went in and, and you know did what I could do for a month. And while I was there, the call came from West Ham. Yeah. And what was what was being at West Ham like? Brilliant. Really, really loved it as a. You know, if you, if you look around the London clubs, Wenger was ensconced at the Arsenal, Tottenham were, were employing foreign managers and coaches, Chelsea the same. For someone like me, who'd, who'd had a successful coaching career, to get the West Ham job at the time as a, as a coach was as high as I thought I could sort of get as a Londoner. Yeah. You know, the, the Manchester people have Manchester to a certain degree, but, you know, Liverpool were my... So for a London boy to get the West Ham job was terrific for me and I really loved my time there. Fans were great, team was very good, got relegated but then had to get straight back up, which we did. Yes. And uh, five minutes to go at Wembley, you know, brilliant day for, for West Ham fans. You know, f football clubs fans are similar all around the, the London that, to my knowledge but I'd have to say that if you want to see an unhappy West, if you want to see an unhappy fan, see an unhappy West Ham fan. <laughs> if you want to see a happy fan, see a happy West Ham fan. Yeah. You know, there's no sort of, well, we did all right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if they're unhappy, you know about it. And if they're happy, yeah. they, you know about it. Which is how football should be. It's a proper football club. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. And then you worked briefly with Harry Redknapp at QPR. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Steve McLaren left and went yeah. to manage Derby. Uh, Rangers were about fifth or sixth in the league. I went there, and we got promoted via the playoffs into uh, to at Wembley again. What a way to get promoted there! You know, West Ham was the 85th minute, one nil, and then a nightmare sort of eight minutes hanging on where we we, we we played really well, hadn't got the goal, got the goal, and then immediately played appallingly for the next. Eight minutes, you know, human nature being what it is yeah. in a playoff game, as 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 we know from from Wembley with, with us a couple of years ago. But QPR, we had a fella sent off after thirty minutes, Gary O'Neill, and uh, you know, we, uh, no chance. Derby had you know, one hundred and five percent of the ball, and you know, QPR on it. But eighty nine minutes, Bobby Zamora scores, you know, and then three minutes of hell. Yeah. You know, we were comfortable for an hour with 10 men, go one up and, you know, it's even worse. Yeah. But again, a brilliant, you know, I, I grew up supporting QPR, so that was a, that was a great time for me as well, having, having the six months there. See, your record at all these different clubs, 
I didn't realise until I started to research this interview. You've had quite a bit, a bit of success, haven't you? Well, I think AFC so far, the only club I've not had success at so far, promotion or, or a cup win. But I've only been here six weeks. So. <laughs> <laughs> let's just talk, we'll talk briefly about Wimbledon, but then let's just talk, because it's interesting for me. You went to India, Steve Koppel invited you out to India and you were involved with two or three clubs there. Yeah. It must be so different football out in India. It is because you've got the mix of the Indian guys. There's a squad of 25. You can have eight foreigners and 17 Indians. You have to have six Indians on the pitch at all times, so five foreigners. But the mixture of the cultures of the two Brazilians, a Spanish guy and a, a Colombian and a Greek guy interacting with the 17 Indian guys. And how does that work? Well, it, you have to make it work because it's a little bit like American football. There's a draft and there's a team for the year and the owners pick a few and you, you, you get to pick some of the foreigners, but the oh, owners pick who they like oh, right. okay. and you get to work with them. So yeah. you go in and you have to mould a team for the year. Now, they kept, Steve only ever, wherever we are, wherever I've worked with him, he only ever signs a year's contract. Because yeah. if he's one of those guys, if he, if if he's not happy with the way it's going, he, he he will walk away. By the same token, the club can always get rid of him. So he doesn't go through the three-year thing and all the shenanigans over long contracts, which doesn't help me for any sort of stability as a coach. Like, but you know, you go with with what he is. So we we would have to form a team in a year, eighteen games over like four or five months. It's getting a little bit longer now, and um, get into the playoffs and and then hopefully win the playoffs. But it makes it's it's terrific there as a coach because there's no baggage. You're not going into a club that have that have had a bad run and the the, the previous manager has soured them and he's not played him and they might come in oh, another new manager. How long is he going to be here? Whereas you go into a club and it's all fresh. There's no baggage and they got big ears and big eyes and they want to learn. They know it's a one season thing and we're all focused on that that game and and as long as the information you give them they think is of benefit to them quickly it's great because then everybody yeah. starts pulling in the same direction yeah. and you get going it's, it's, it's a terrific thing completely different experience from from Complete. the UK okay and then you got a phone call from Harry Bassett didn't you yeah it's Harry was sort of go between and said to me that uh, AFC will th you know about to make a change and, and would I be interested? Straight no away brainer. you thought yes? No yeah. brainer. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, my career after Brentford took a different path. You know, I, when I left Brentford, I went straight to Reading, as we said, but while I was at Reading, I didn't sort of, if the Northampton job came up, I didn't apply there from Steve. I'd stayed loyal to Steve because he gave me the job. So I didn't, get back onto the managerial will. And the same thing about India, you know, I sort of wouldn't say I'd exhaust, looked like I'd exhausted everywhere around here without really putting out to go be going outside the M25 or up north. So I'd been out of work for like six months, nine months, and then got the India. So then again, my career's gone again. And I'm now, I, would get, I was getting more phone calls from Qatar, and Indonesia and China really? than I was. Yeah. Where you you know you speak with different agents and they talk yeah. to you about positions. So my fo my incoming calls from England were becoming fewer, but my global calls were becoming more. Yeah. So my career had gone again in a different path, which I was I was okay with. You know, sometimes you think you've done your time and you may come back at some stage, but I was I wasn't on the phone all the time saying oh, I've got to come back. I've got to come back. What job offers are there here? You know, there were, there were opportunities around the world. So when to get the call, if it had been, you know, a call from someone saying there's this job at Scunthorpe or there's this job at, you know, Wickham, probably wouldn't have interested me. But, you know, to get the call from the, the you know, the club that I feel a, you know, a real bond with wasn't an issue. I just said, Dave, yeah, if there's, any, you know, whatever they want me to do, however they want me to do it. I'm more than happy to do. And how was it when you came in and we lost eight consecutive league games and we were still obviously in the we won the FA Cup um, first and second rounds and of course Simon Bassey was interim manager. We'd started to win a little bit more there. 
but how was it when you came in? I'm thinking more for you than for the, <coughs> for the players. How, how was it in your first training session? Well, whenever I go in any club, the most important thing is the first session that you put on. So I've got a stock session that I put on that I know is enjoyable. I know the dimensions. I could put it on in this studio for you. Like, you know, it, it really is good. You know, it's good. It's, it's not massively tactical or technical, but it gets my voice across to the players. They enjoy it. It's successful. There's gold mouth stuff. So your first session is the one because if, if they think for a moment you don't know what you're on about, then they'll be going straight after this oh, new bloke. What's, what's, it, what's all yeah. that about? You've got, you've got to a, win their confidence. You've got to straight away. Yeah. You've got to show them that what you're going to give them will benefit them individually. First of all, it's individual. Mm. Any professional footballer will listen to anybody who is going to improve them as a player, which will improve their prospects of you know getting in. If you can then take that improvement and put it into the team, great. But footballers being footballers, if I can help you and make you better and get you more a better you know deal or a better player, then they'll listen. If they don't think that, well, you know you lose them. So. It's important that you get the, everybody on board on the first day, so they're, they're going and think, "Well, that was all right, wasn't it? He don't seem bad." That was all right. <laughs> and that's half the battle. Then yeah. you start to, you know, you can start to to get them to buy into what you want them to do. But the first day is critical. So I thought coming in, whatever it is, whatever I do needs to be different because, it, you know, even even Simon being in there was samey. You know, and I don't know. I, I never asked if you changed it drastically, but you know, the mood needs to change. Whatever you've been doing hasn't been working. You're good footballers, yeah. but you know, Neil's a good manager. But all of a sudden, it looks like you're not. So there's just something gone wonky. So change was the important thing. I had to whatever it was, I had to. They had to think this is different. Yeah, you. I'd looked in India watching the games. And, uh, what you watched Wimbledon games? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I'm a fan. On the so, iPlayer. Yeah, uh, yeah on, a, on the iPlayer. And as a coach, it's probably an ego thing. Any game you watch, you think, oh, I could do something there. Now, we weren't getting beat 3 0 and 4 0 and 5 1 or anything like that. We'd be 1 up and lose 2 1, or we'd let two set pieces in and we wouldn't score a penalty. Or, so you'd always look and think, well, that could be changed. I could do something about that. Well, I could definitely do something about that. But I wasn't doing that specifically for thinking Neil would go. You, that's how, as a coach, that's how you watch any game. Yeah. Man United v Juventus. Why doesn't he come around? I could do something about that. So when it came in, I was sort of clued up about what was going on at the club, and and, I, and you know you've got to have confidence in your own ability. And I th sitting there, I was thinking, well, that could that. So I was ready, ready for the job, really. But without ever thinking it would come along because I'd been watching from the start of the season. I was down the last... It was Coventry the first game of the season? Coventry was the second game we drew nil nil. We won the first game, won the left That's right away, yeah. yeah. And so Coventry was my cut-off for going to India. Right. So I got yeah. down for the Coventry game, watched that, thought, it's OK. Yeah. Good result, Coventry. Yeah. And then that was me gone. Yeah. You always seem to be very positive. Well, I'm glad, you say, I'm glad you say There's a, a lot of members of my family. <laughs> really? <laughs> I'm not, yeah. What's he like? Is he happy today? No, just how miserable is he? So, <laughs> so you get miserable sometimes. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm happy talking about football. I'm happy yeah. being around footballers. That's what I do. I like to think, I'm, you know, I can inspire people to be better. So, yeah, football floats my boat. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks for coming in, talking to us, Wally. Really appreciate that. Good luck. Thank you. And uh, you've had, you haven't had a bad start. You've Let's see, you played 7-1-3, drawn two, lost two. It's not a bad start. Well, we had a great week the other week. We beat Wickham away. We had like three games in a week that I thought were all winnable. We won the first one, which sets it up for a nine-point week. Won the second one. Went into against Blackpool for the third one, who was sixth or seventh in the league. Yeah. And we drew nil-nil. Yeah. So disappointed not to get the nine points, but got the first clean sheet yeah. we'd had. Yeah. Great week and finished up going bottom of the league. Everyone around us had won. So. Yeah, but they're, they're pretty big clubs around us in yeah. terms of their resources. Yeah. Bristol Rep compared but you to don't, us. Yeah. That's why you can sort of not worry too much about the league. You've just got to worry about Absolutely. your performance and your next Absolutely. game and your next game. Yeah. Okay. Thanks again for coming in. Thanks, Ian. Good luck. Really enjoyed it. 
and thanks for watching Cherry Red TV and hearing all about Wally and we'll see you again soon. Goodbye.